Welcome everyone. Good evening, good morning, maybe good night if you're in Australia, who knows. My name is Johannes and I'd like to introduce my course on German Idealism, which will begin, it's Tuesday now, which will begin in exactly four days on Saturday, June 18th. That's when the live group seminars will begin, which we hold over Zoom. So if you know anyone who is interested in German idealism, do let them know about this course and also maybe send them the link to this stream. And if anyone who's watching right now has a question on German idealism or on this course, please let me know. I have received quite a few emails and with questions on the course. So what I'd like to do is go over the course again and what, well, what we'll learn and what you can choose from. And then also respond to some of the questions I received via email, because I think it's probably a question that everyone has. But if you have questions, please let me know in the chat. And if you want to enroll now, you can do so by following the link in the description of this video. It takes you to a platform called Teachable, which is where the course is organized. And also, very importantly, uh, because sometimes it seems to be confusion, these courses are not held on YouTube. They're not public. They're private. You have to enroll, and only then will you get access to the course. So what we consider in the course is, broadly speaking, German idealism. German idealism is the philosophical movement that spans from around 1780 to 1820 or so. But it's more specifically, Kant and Fichte are, of course, there wouldn't be, there would be no Hegel without Kant and Fichte, but we need on, well, when we think of German idealism, we really, what we mean is Herdelin, I would say Schelling and Hegel. Those, those are truly the true two German idealists, and Hölderlin is part of this as well, but of course he goes astray and becomes a poet rather than a philosopher as the other two. But still, we're going to read as an introduction to this movement, which will be two lectures on Kant. We need to have a firm grounding in Kant, and we'll focus on the first critique. We'll focus on the, well, what Kant is responding to, which is skepticism and rationalism, or empiricism and rationalism, and what he calls the battlefield of, battlefield of metaphysics, dogmatic metaphysics, he is what he critiques in the first critique. And we'll consider his transcendental aesthetic on the form of intuition space and the other form of intuition time. And after that, the second lecture will consider the transcendental deduction, that is the categories in Kant's first critique what I will show you, or what I'd like to get across, is that the first critique is not an epistemology, but a, a reawakening of logic that moves beyond the natural ontology of the dogmatic metaphysics of the times before in early modern times. And therefore, it's a rejuvenation of the Greek spirit. Because for Plato's idealism is a logical idealism. It has got nothing. It's not entities when he speaks of ideas. Once we get to Fichte, we are really firmly in, and there's a, so actually there's a, a lecture I published, or an excerpt of the lecture is published here on this channel, and that gives you an idea about what the course is like, what the lectures are like, etc. That's one of the newest uh, videos up here on on Fichte's Transcendental Ego, there's about 15 minutes or 20 minutes of the original lecture here, so you can listen to that, and if you'd like to enroll when, when you see that, then you can do so. As I said before, if you have any questions on German idealism or this course, please let me know in the chat and I'll respond. After Fichte, what we'll read is, we'll read from Fichte, we'll read a few passages from the vocation, and we'll consider mostly the self-positing ego and the 
the, the this Faustian strife in 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 Fichte, you know the, the the self that must continuously strive against nature and try to subdue it, try to overcome it, try to make sure that it establishes itself firmly and with well with certainty over nature and wants to in order to attain human freedom it wants to the transcendental ego that is it needs to well it needs to crowd out all necessity and in so doing of course it destroys nature and after fichte who already saw the the aporias of kant and the the, the limitations of transcendental philosophy, but wasn't able to overcome those himself. We'll see why thinkers like Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel become necessary. They become necessary because, well, because nature disappears, for example. And because the, for example, when we, when we read Schelling, what we're going to consider is the is how we can think together human freedom and necessity. So the place of, of man, let's say, in nature without having to crowd out all necessity or all nature, all that is foreign to the self. With Hölderlin, we're going to read one poem by Hölderlin, which is the poem Die Muse, translated as leisure in English. So there's a bit of a... Uh, a relief in between the uh, in between the you know the, the quite difficult readings from Kant and well Fichte is less difficult to be honest uh, than Kant at least what we're going to consider sorry just a second and once though we are in in Hölderlin there will be uh, it just in in during the um, after the third week so right at the 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 middle of the of the course, we're going to read Hölderlin and in that way really get into get into a German idealism proper. Hölderlin, Schelling, and and Hegel, if you believe it or not, were all by ascending of being were roommates in Tübingen. I was just in Tübingen actually. I just came back a couple of days ago. Um, because I gave a, I was I gave a talk on death and health in Gestell in in uh, in Heidegger. There was an incident, I guess uh, you know which which conference is an international at this point, but it, it was a conference on Heidegger. So I went there. I was invited to give a talk. I was very uh, happy to do so. And well. I saw again, I've been there now many times, I saw again the Tübinger Stift, this student dorm, let's say, where Hegel, Schelling, and Hölderlin all became roommates. And not too far from this, very close to this, is the tower where Hölderlin locked himself in. Um, and so once we get to, to Hölderlin, we are... Uh, firmly with, within what I would call German idealism. What they do, these three, Hegel, Schelling, and Hölderlin, is they read Heraclitus together. And here he is, Heraclitus. I think, so the hen kai pan, the one and many, the one and all, they try to articulate this, each in their own way. And you will see that once we get to this, what they try to not solve for, but think through, is a way of establishing or uh, yeah allowing for human freedom that at the same time doesn't subdue nature and um, at the same time allow for nature in the way that it doesn't crowd out or destroy the human uh, being either. At the same time, it's also, as I said before, especially with Hegel, it rises to the level again of logic, which is also how one should understand Plato's idealism. It is one, the EDI are logical principles, they're not entities or things or any such silly uh, reification. So that's a word we're going to hear 
quite often during the course is the word reification. It's a, an attempt, the, these are attempts to think in enactment rather than reifying and talking about different things, as it were. So anyways, Hölderlin, Schelling and Hegel read Heraclitus together and try to articulate how there could be a harmony between opposites. Hence, Hölderlin coins the term the, the harmoniously in opposition. And he tries to not solve it, but withstand it in his poetry. And this is what we're going to consider in, in Herderlin. Mostly we are then moving on to Schelling in lecture number five. And in this fifth lecture, Schelling, um, what we're going to consider is his essay on freedom and on necessity and freedom and how to think them together. So we're also going to consider evil in Schelling and the necessity for evil to be able to be free and his notion of real idealism or realism, idealism. And in Schelling, what we will find though is that there's he always, his thought moves with a certain givenness. So there's uh, just, the, the real is simply presupposed and it it becomes not what he actually blames Spinoza for and he does that rightly he blames of Schelling does he blames Spinoza for the sterility of his mechanical philosophy but still there's a threat in Schelling that human freedom also uh, disappears precisely because there's always a givenness and hence we turn to Hegel, which is the absolute highest articulation of Occidental philosophy, of Occidental metaphysics, with his presuppositionless philosophy. There's the final lecture where we're going to read together the beginning of the science of logic, where we're going to read being, nothing and how they collapse into each other or vanish into each other and through their vanishing becoming uh, arises as the first proper category of the logic a proper presuppositionless philosophy so that's a short overview over the course as i said before if you have questions on trying idealism in general or on the course specifically let me know please i'll respond so just type it into the chat if you want to um, you can enroll now. There are three different options. I'm going to uh, just talk about this very briefly, what they are. And, well, they are the following. You can either do self-study. That means you enroll now. You get access to six lectures plus so video, audio, and the lecture notes. And you can study it at your own pace, at your own time, for as long as you want. You have access for at uh, eternitatem, so for all eternity. Then the middle tier is the fellowship or seminars, which begin this Saturday, so in about four days. If you enroll with that, I'm, so that's one of the questions from the emails is, is there a TA? There's no TA, I lead the seminars. So I will be sitting here, we meet over Zoom, and then we discuss your questions, but we, you also have a breakout sessions, smaller group sessions with everybody else in the course. So if you you can experiment with your own ideas, you meet new people to discuss philosophy with over the course of seven weeks in total. And you also, during this time, you will be asked, you don't have to, but if you want, you can, you can send me up to two essays, short essays, and I will give you not feedback because that's cybernetic language. I will provide you with genuine commentary as I try and think with you what it is that you were trying to say and give you advice on how to improve your writing and also what to read next, etc. And this will be leading up to the final seminar, the pro seminar, where you present your own talk. So you can write, for example, something on Kant at the beginning, maybe something on Schelling a bit later on, and then present a talk on Kant and Schelling at the last seminar. Or, of course, you can present something on Hegel in the final seminar, too. That's perfectly fine. So 
that's the middle tier and then there's one left which is the the third tier where you get uh, six private sessions with me so if you have if you want to meet with me to discuss these texts and for the detail or maybe you have a writing project or so i mean do make sure that it fits with what we're doing here if if you're writing on dostoevsky or or something something aliens no i mean it has to be probably on german idealism i would think um so <clears throat> That's the highest tier. If you follow the link in the description of this video now, then you'll see the um, you'll see the the website where you can enroll. And as I said before, this is not available uh, on YouTube. So enroll here. I'll put it in the chat. Please let me know if you have any questions. By the way, on the course. So let me know <laughs> in the chat now so I can respond. That's the link to enroll. I just put it in. So uh, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> so you can use this or copy paste it okay so it give you a hundred dollars off but you have to enroll now and there's only three left or so of this coupon i have to limit that a bit so anyways let me also respond to some of the questions i got over email so the first one was whether there's a ta there's no ta i'm the one who's leading the seminar so i'll be sitting here and taking your questions you come in I introduce the topic for the day to the group. Then we have a first breakout session. Then we go on with the with the group discussion. And we I probably send you off to another breakout session. Then I'll split it up a bit this time, uh, so we have a bit of an interruption in between those. So you can ask questions and come back and uh, then go back out into a smaller group. But there's always enough time to ask me questions. Usually the seminars are two hours long. But quite often, um, they go a bit longer depending on the group size. So they can be maybe two and a half hours or so, depending on, on the mood also. So there's another question that I got, which was how much time, if you enroll for the middle tier, the seminars, how much time you think you might have to spend? So think about it in this way. If... For example, during the week, you uh, you maybe you listen to the lecture, my lecture, the pre-recorded lecture that takes about fifty-five minutes, maybe an hour. So maybe you, you listen to it on your way to work, or so, and split that maybe over two days. Maybe you take some notes, some, some things that are unclear. So that's an hour, and depending on which time zone you're in. Of course, you can spend some time Friday evening uh, reading a bit. The readings are not very long. Uh, with, with, in terms of with Kant, it's quite difficult. With Hegel, it's going to be very difficult. Fichte, Hölderlin, Schelling, they're not that difficult, I would think. So, but if you maybe invest, invest another two hours, spend another two hours or so on the readings, plus... Uh, then the seminar. So you can look at maybe three hours or so of preparation plus the two hours of seminars. Anything that's unclear will try to um, explain. Not too much, of course, because we need to have some mystery left in it also. But once, so maybe all in all, four or five hours or so per week. And of course, the idea is not that you walk away and become experts or so. This is a, an introductory course that if you take enough notes you can always come back to the lectures and when you do over time over the next years or so this is how it was for me also as a student this is what it was like i took a uh, a seminar on on dialectical logic many many years i think now five or six years ago in, in vienna and i still to this day go over my notes from this one weekend where I learned so much. It was about eight hours or so per day for two and a half days. And during this time, I took lots of notes, probably didn't understand all that much. Um, just so when you go to a conference, I usually take a lot of notes and can always come back to it. The same idea here with a course such as this one. And as I said before, please let me know if you have any questions before I go so that I can um, 
respond to them uh, while I'm still here. I think also maybe just to explain, we're going to read, this was another question, if I recommend any secondary, uh, so-called secondary sources, we will read only the primary sources. You can read, of course, if you want, you can read, for example, I think Frederick Bice's John Idealism is very good. I think Stephen Holgate's Introduction to Hegel is very good. Uh, there are other very many good books um, that I uh, could, you know, mention, um, but I won't now. But it, it will really be focusing on the on the on the primary sources because we do want to make sure that we develop again the capacity to read uh, difficult texts uh, on their own and see also that there is a uh, almost, or you could say, almost a necessary development. I mean, logically speaking, right? We shouldn't conflate um, isms with history. Uh, that becomes a big contingent. But there is a logical development very often. And that, that one will try to trace why, for example, Fichte has to develop, he has to develop the self-positing I after Kant, because in Kant, there is no principle, as it were, that keeps everything together with thanks to its self-activity. We also want to understand why there is what was now called the, the turn to objective idealism in Schelling and, for example, Hölderlin also to a certain degree, this turn to nature after Fichte, because in Fichte, nature disappears entirely. Because Fichte is, you could say, <clears throat> almost a bit in the background of, of, of the, um, of, uh, well, of the existentialists, you know, this proto, this weird self-positing freedom somewhere from the noumenon. Um, and yeah, so one of the things that then, so that's very important that we understand the development and also what's in the background. Maybe I should say this also, um, in what sense, um, yeah, then if, if you have, oh, there's a question, sorry. Could you perhaps say a bit about how Kierkegaard is related to the tradition of John Judaism? Well, we had a, a Kierkegaardian last year. One of the things that, that's Camillo, one of the things that Camillo said, and I think that probably tells you something about the course, or the courses Camillo came to many of them last year and the year before, which is it allows you to read some of the most difficult and fundamental texts while you know losing this false respect for them. You need, you need to have the good respect for these texts in order not to destroy them. But by false respect, I mean the respect that lets you shy away from reading them. The way in which I think we could say Kierkegaard uh, relates to mostly to, to Hegel is that Kierkegaard sees something that is furthered by Heidegger and others, and maybe also Nietzsche without Nietzsche being necessarily aware of Kierkegaard, uh, which is that with Hegel, the fulfillment of Occidental metaphysics and of especially of speculative reason is achieved, is attained, and this is at once a triumph as much as it is <laughs> an end. And I would think that Kierkegaard, you know, I don't care about so much about, he, he, he criticizes Hegel for this and he doesn't think this. I think maybe, you know, with, with Kierkegaard, you would have to say that he's not necessarily a dialectical thinker, which probably leads to some strange assumptions. But what I really can say with certainty, or 
some authority is that I, her Kierkegaard already sees this having come to an end of speculative reason and sees the necessity for what we could perhaps refer to with Heidegger and a few others as ecstatic uh, and ecstatic and taking oneself out of this motion but it has but it but then again it needed to to find its its fruition and fulfillment with hegel first before kierkegaard can see this good question so something okay so ali um if if ali for example enrolls in the course then this is something that if there's an interest i would assume then ali might want to present on this at the pro seminar especially after having read uh, Kant and Hegel, etc., and having gone through the motions, being able to speak then with some authority to the project. By the way, this is something I've seen over the years also of doing this, is how people become, if they stay and if they do the work, they become really good at the, well, at writing and presenting at, uh, well, ordering their thoughts and focusing a bit better. So that is something that can come, of course, from this. If there are any more questions, let me know. Maybe I'll say this again because you never know when people come in a jump coming. If you know anyone who is interested in German idealism, I know there's lots of new subscribers now. Uh, if you're very new, I run my own online philosophy academy and i've done this for more than two years now and it's well it's my response as it were to the current predicament of academic philosophy and of academia uh, in general which i see very much and i hear this anywhere now as you can imagine i have little birds singing to me from all over the world it's pretty much happening everywhere. It's very much um, not only a problem of the Anglophone world uh, that I hear that something is coming to an end here, that uh, something has died or is dying. As you know, in, in philosophy, simply in analytical philosophy is absolutely and completely colonizing everything and everywhere. Uh, at the same time, they have absolutely no access to thought in the proper sense. I would think it's a bit of a weird enterprise that collapsed with Quine, but still they keep going and no one knows why. Um, but still, there's other issues, you know, not, not, these, not these old battles between the continentals and the analytics. There is simply something very rotten at the core of the university. Uh, and it is no longer the place for scolaire, for proper leisurely activity and formation of the soul, the body, and the spirit, but it has become a graveyard. Uh, not even a graveyard, if only it were a graveyard. You know, there, would be, there might be some respect for the dead bodies, but not even that's left, I would think. And whatever is going to wake it up again, I won't be the one doing it. That's why I left and I'm outside. And <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, Ali, that's good. I agree. And so if you, so yeah, so, so this is, you know, my, my way of, of, of trying to live, you could say live philosophically, which is a bit of, you know, sounds a bit like a cliche, but uh well, to, to profess publicly, uh, which is what a professor does, and not only profess, but then also act and enact accordingly and try and be open to the transformation that is necessary that comes with it. At the same time, of course, as I just mentioned before, I, you know, this is never personal. I speak with academics. I go to academic conferences if, if I get invited. Um, this is not to say, this is not either or. It's not black and white. This is not uh, that. It's not that simple. Uh, where we are, uh, there are extremely good people inside the institutions, obviously. But um, the problem 
is what the institutions themselves or the institution itself has morphed into. And that has you know, certain implications, but has certain roots that cannot be, I think, uh, either discussed away or cannot be optimized away. Um, so I think we're at the, uh, at the, pre at a very, at the, a, there's a, you know, we're at the very edge of what a university can be. And that has to do with technology, but not only, it also has to do with, um, I think with shifts in, let's just say in history itself, in the Occident, that make the university not obsolete, but no longer the place where it can, where knowledge or wisdom or true formation can reside. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So this is my response of trying to build something that can withstand these shifts and that will also come out on top at the end of this tsunami that we are living through. Let me know if there are more questions on the course or on German idealism. I hope that you can enroll. We start in exactly four days from now, this Saturday, June 18th. And we're going to read Kant, Fichte, Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel. I lead the seminars. You can ask me questions. You can discuss it with the other, your peers in the group. You can present your own talk at the end. You can write short papers and essays in between. And well, while you do this and you have enrolled, you have also become, I have to say, a patron, a modern day patron of the arts. Not only do you <coughs> get a course, but you can, well, you support the work here on the channel and of the academy. As you may know, there are other people already teaching here. Also, there's Daniel Saruba, who teaches courses on Japanese philosophy. There's Philip Nicholas, who last year taught a masterclass on Hegel and will at some point soon maybe later this year, early next year, we'll teach a course on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. He has also gone through the very good school of Stephen Holgate, who was at Warwick where I was as well for my PhD, which was on Heidegger. And I've, I've got a bit of Hegel and, and, and Kant in my, in my book and in my thesis. So, yeah, well, you will be supporting not only the work, but also helping build an academy. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment because I now have to go. Leave a comment. I'll respond if it's specifically on the course. Everything you need to know on enrollment is in the um, there's in the in the description of this video. There are links, etc. So yeah, well, so as Daniel is here, apparently. Daniel just wrote the following. So Daniel is the gentleman from Vienna who teaches, and very well he teaches. Uh, he taught a course on Nishitani's Religion and Nothingness last year, and this year a course, Introduction to Japanese Philosophy, and Daniel just wrote the following. To everyone who's interested, there are also extracurricular activities such as movie nights and reading groups, and many participants form intimate friendships and fellowships. So Daniel came two and a half years ago for the first course. Now he's a teacher. But also, I think it's very fair to say that Daniel is always involved with different uh, reading groups that form from the seminars. And people usually, if you're active, you will stay in touch with not everyone, but with some of the people. and. Daniel, I, I, as I know, has become friends with many. Some of them I've invited to come to London this year, but that's a different story. And also, you, well, you'll see that there are others out there who also want to read uh, philosophy, and you, you'll be able to meet them. And none of this is structured, of course. So what happens 
what whoever you meet during the seminars there's no uh, this is what a university i think should be or or seminars should be there for and and good conferences should be there for also that you meet friends and continue the the work outside the classroom so the classroom is only the is is where is where the ignition happens but then everything else you continue on your own afterwards I, as far as i know there's there's to this day there's a there's a reading group of people who read plato's timaeus uh during the first year there were there was a group daniel was involved with it daniel was involved with it they read being in time together heidegger's being in time and last year as far as i know there was a reading group also uh on hegel and yeah so do come do join come if you you know come to the course you'll be involved with with the the larger group afterwards if you're active and i hope to see you all inside the idea or to quote uh, philip nicholas keep it ideal so i'll see you on saturday in four days exactly for the first group seminar on german idealism and if you know anyone was interested also please share this video with them and let them know that they can enroll and i hope to see you all on saturday thank you very much indeed i shall retire good night <laughs>